Hello again everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Now, people who think that the Earth is flat or that space doesn't exist by default have to argue that the International Space Station is therefore fake as well. Otherwise, the photos and videos from it that show it orbiting in space around the globe Earth rather put a damper on their claims. Now, they accept that there is something shaped like the ISS that passes overhead, but they don't believe it's actually in space or that there's anyone on board. They argue instead that it's something like a plane or a hologram. Anything looking at the externals of the space station, the showing a globe, is apparently just CGI, and the footage of people from the space station is apparently actually faked on Earth. The spacewalk footage is supposedly shot in a swimming pool, and the onboard footage is shot in a studio. Even the 50 minute long complete tour of the inside of the ISS, which has huge stints of uncut footage showing everything in a weightless environment, just gets hand waved away with excuses along the lines of it's shot in a mock-up ISS with astronauts on wire harnesses which are edited out in post and some of the panels of the mock-up are missing to allow the harness cables through them and these are then edited back in later and any floating objects that astronauts interact with are just animations. So in this video, I am going to present what I believe is 100% absolutely undebunkable proof that the ISS is in space orbiting a globe. Just in case there wasn't enough already. And this is my evidence. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're thinking, Dave, this is just a video. And the obvious excuse that people will give is it's CGI. Well, fear not, because this isn't just a video, and I am fairly confident it blocks every possible excuse of fakery that people can throw at it once we've gone through some key aspects of how cameras work. So even if this video fails in convincing people that the ISS is actually up there, hopefully by the end of it, you'll have learned something new about cameras. And if not, then I apologize for wasting your time, and you should go to brilliant.org and learn something new there instead because they have hundreds of classes covering maths, science, and computing. The classes are very relaxed and with intuitive animations that make learning so much simpler. I'm still continuing my daily streak and I'm currently up to day 120. If you get a question wrong, it will walk you through the answers so that you can learn from your mistake. And they've now introduced leagues. So for each question that you answer correctly, you'll earn experience points. And at the end of each week, the top players in each league will progress on to the next league. And at the moment, I'm sitting in the Tungsten League. And if you'd like to come and join me, then head on over using my link in the description, brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and the first 200 people to do so will receive 20% off an annual subscription. So as I was saying, this isn't a standard video. A standard video like what I'm shooting now has the camera in video mode recording the information from the sensor, and then the processing unit in the camera is discarding any unnecessary information between the frames and compressing all the data down into a lossy compression video format and saving it as one individual MP4 video file. This footage from the ISS, however, is a time-lapse video whereby they have a Nikon DSLR set up looking out of one of the windows and it's programmed to capture a still image every few seconds. This entire clip is made up of 1,338 individual complete photographs. Each one of these individual photographs can be viewed and downloaded from this website, eol.jsc.nasa.gov, and I'll leave a link to it down below as well. I've actually got all 1,338 images saved on my computer, and that's what I've used to make this time lapse myself. In fact, I've got to thank Planner Walk for helping me to do that because they wrote a brilliant little piece of code which was able to download all of the images based off the URLs rather than me having to go to each file individually. So they have multiple time lapse videos, and on each one, you can view each individual frame from it. And the image data not only shows you the date and time that each frame was taken, but it gives you latitude and longitude from where it was captured and a complete breakdown of the camera's metadata of when the image was taken. 
So I can see, for example, this shot was taken with a Nikon D5 DSLR with a 20.8 megapixel resolution. I can see the shutter, aperture, and ISO settings that we used, that it was shot with a Nikkor 24mm f1.4 G lens, which isn't a fisheye lens. I can even see that the lens was set to a focusing distance of almost four meters away, which coupled with the 24mm field of view in the f16 aperture, gives such a deep depth of field that everything in the distance will look in focus. Now, none of this might sound particularly amazing. However, I draw your attention to the file type. Nikon NEF, and this is an NEF file. NEF is Nikon's version of a RAW file, and there is an option to download these RAW files. Now, it does state request the RAW file, but it's not like you have to make an official request and wait for approval. You simply click the request button, and then you have to wait a few minutes, and then click the link, and it should download. If it says there's no file available, then you wait a bit longer and you try again. I think the reason they have this is because there's so many raw files and the files themselves are so large, they don't store them on the web page themselves. You've got to sort of retrieve them from a database. But so far, none of the images that I've tried downloading have prevented me from eventually getting the raw file. And this is what destroys the debunking opportunities. You may not realize it, but on a digital camera, the sensor is actually able to capture much more information than it initially lets on. When you view the screen to compose an image, it will show you a preview of that image. Hit the capture button and that's the captured image you will see. Now, many lower end cameras will only record in JPEG format, which is a universal file type. Any display, website or program is able to process them. However, it's a very lossy compression format. So when the image is taken, the light will hit all the tiny photosites on the sensor. This generates a small electrical charge within the photosite, and the size of the charge will depend on the amount of light getting in. At the end of the exposure, the photosites will convert these microvoltages into a digital signal, which will then be offloaded to the processor to form an image. But the sensor will have detected a much broader range of light than the screen preview has shown you. So if you're recording in JPEG, then the camera will pretty much discard all that excess information that you couldn't see in the preview because it's deemed that it's now irrelevant to the finished image. Any settings you have in place for color balance in the camera will then be baked into the file as well, thus locking in the appearance of the colors. I.e., if you're shooting in JPEG and you set it to shoot in black and white, the file will be then stuck in black and white. However, many higher-end cameras these days offer photographers the ability to shoot in what we call RAW. Now, this is the RAW data from the sensor, but instead of it being altered or bits discarded by the processor before saving, instead, all that RAW information from the sensor is thrown straight into a file and saved to the memory card. RAW isn't specifically a file format, rather a blanket term for this kind of raw data file, and each camera manufacturer creates their own version of a raw format. I use Sony for example, and they've made a raw format called ARW. Canon have created CR2 and .CR3 file formats, and Nikon use NEF. Now, RAW files are significantly larger than JPEG because of all that extra data, but photographers love the format because it gives much more flexibility when it comes to editing. There's no color balance settings baked into the file, so you can freely change those afterwards. For example, shoot RAW with the camera set to black and white, and the file will still remain all of the color data so that you can revert back to a color image later if you wish. And that extra color depth and information also means that you can brighten up areas of the image and see much more detail that's hiding in the shadows where JPEG would have often discarded all of that. Now this can't be some miniature model of the ISS because we know the lens that it was shot with. It wasn't a macro lens used for close up, it was a wide angle lens that was focused 4 meters away. And we can see the window frame around it, and being a RAW file, we have a lot of flexibility to then brighten up the shadows and see the details of the window. 
FYI, all the red and blue specks that you can see are actually damaged pixels on the sensor caused by prolonged exposure to radiation. We can even see a reflection of the camera lens in the window during the opening frames as the sunlight is shining directly at it. So we have a clear view of a globe. It can't be curvature due to a fisheye lens because it's not a fisheye lens. And if it were a fisheye lens, neither section of this arm in the middle of the frame would look straight, nor would the space station across the edge of the image. We can see the lighting changes very smoothly throughout, starting with it shining straight at the camera, and no amount of dropping the exposure can reveal any detail within that light source, despite the fact that the settings that are being used are very, very low for artificial lighting, meaning that that light source is literally as bright as the sun. There are long shadows being cast on the clouds in the parts of Earth that are just starting to see sunrise, and these gradually progress to shadows casting more downwards as we get to areas where the sun is more overhead. There's the changing glimmer of sunlight reflecting off the water, but not off the clouds or the land, so we're not looking at some sort of giant glow model because all the textures are different. If it were some sort of projection of Earth, Firstly, given the focus distance of the lens and the size of the ISS that we can see, that projection would be bigger than a building. But we should then also see some sort of evidence of a projection screen. And also, if it were a projection screen, we wouldn't be able to have such a bright light source shining directly at us from the direction of the screen, sufficient to cause such noticeable changes to the lighting on the space station itself. Then you'll also note that there is a Dragon capsule docked at the space station, the window of which is angled at about 45 degrees and so is giving us a beautiful reflection of the Earth 90 degrees below. The reflections we see correlate with the parts of Earth that have just left underneath the frame. Now, if we're facing a projection screen, then that angled window wouldn't have line of sight to the screen. So there we are. I would be interested to see any flat earthers arguments for how that is a fake earth with a fake space station perfectly presented in so many images. And for any flat earther who's ever asked for a provably unedited photo of the globe, right here are 1,338 of them. And that is just from one time lapse. They have 15 more time lapses on the website, all with raw frames available, as well as hundreds of individual images taken of Earth throughout various expeditions, again, all in raw format. And I think that is going to draw this video to a close. Thanks once again to Brilliant.org for sponsoring it. If you've enjoyed it and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and then hopefully... We'll see you in the next video.